How old were you when you first went to the grocery store driving the car on your own? Or how old were you when you first mowed the lawn? Or how old were you when you paid a bill? Chapter 19, Coming of Age. This is Nancy Farmer, The House of the Scorpion. El Patron's burst of energy didn't last long. Soon he was as pale and weak as ever. He rambled on about his childhood and even his seven brothers and sisters, who had all died young. He listened to Matt play the guitar, although the boy's fingers weren't long enough yet to play really complicated pieces. Matt's voice was high and sweet, an angel's voice. Celia said, El Patron went into a quiet daze when he listened to it. Matt loved to see the old man then, with his eyes half closed and his mouth curved up in a gentle smile. It was uh, better than any compliment. One day, as Matt was singing a Spanish ballad, his voice cracked. It dropped more than an octave to produce a sound more like a, a, a braying donkey than a boy. Embarrassed, he cleared his throat and, and tried again. At first, the song went smoothly, but after a few moments, the same thing happened. Matt stood up in confusion. He was going through puberty. So it has happened, murmured El Patron from his bed. I'm sorry. I'll ask Cecilia for cough drops, said Matt. You don't know what's wrong, do you? You're so cut off from the rest of the world you don't know. I'll be okay tomorrow. The old man laughed, a dry, dusty sound. Ask Celia or Tamlin to explain. Just play for me without singing. That's good enough. But when Matt asked Celia later, she threw her apron over her face and burst into tears. What is it? What's wrong? cried Matt, thoroughly alarmed. You've grown up, wailed Celia from behind the apron. Isn't that okay? Matt's voice to his horror boomed out like a bass drum. Of course it is, mi vida, said Celia, wiping her eyes with a cloth and putting on an unconvincing smile. It's always a shock when a lamb sprouts horns and turns into a big handsome ram. But it's a good thing, darling. Really, it is. We, pl we must have a party to celebrate. Matt sat in his room with the guitar as he listened to Celia bang pots in the kitchen. He didn't believe it was a good thing to grow up. He could um, read Celia's moods no matter how m many smiles she produced. He knew that underneath she was upset and he wanted to know why. He'd become a man. No, that was, that was wrong. Since, since he wasn't a boy to begin with, he couldn't turn into a man. He was an adult. A clone. An old memory surfaced to the doctor telling Rosa that clones went to pieces when they got older. Matt no longer feared he would actually fall apart, but what did ha what what did happen? Matt f Matt f felt his face for the first hint of whiskers. There was nothing except a couple of bumps left over from his last bout of acne. Maybe it's a mistake, he thought. He attempted the ballad again and made it through only the first line before his throat betrayed him. It was an extremely disappointing. He knew um, his voice wasn't nearly as good as the old one. I wonder if Maria's voice will change too, he thought. The party that night was subdued. Celia and Tamlin sat in the courtyard with glasses of champagne to celebrate Matt's new status. As a special treat, Matt was allowed one, two, although Celia insisted on, on watering it down with lemonade. Fireflies um, had, had ordered from a catalog pulsed across the warm, humid garden. A heavy odor filled the walled-in space from Celia's new and somewhat creepy plants. She said she had ordered them from a um, Coron Corondera in Atzlan. A sudden thought struck Matt. How old am I? he asked, holding out a glass, his glass for a refill. Celia, ignoring him, Ignoring a frown from Tamlin, poured him lemonade instead of, instead of champagne. I know I don't like I don't have a birthday like humans, Matt said, but I was born, or something like it. You were harvested, said Tamlin. His speech was was slurred. He had pol polished off a bottle by himself, 
and Matt realized he'd never seen the bodyguard drink alcohol before. I grew inside a cow. Did she give birth to me like a calf? Matt saw nothing wrong with being born in a stable. Jesus had found it perfectly acceptable. You were harvested, repeated Tamlin. He doesn't need the details, Celia said. And I say he does, roared the man, slamming the fist on the picnic table. Both Celia and Matt flinched. There's been enough damn secrecy around this place. There's been enough damn lies. Please, Celia said urgently, placing her hands on Tamlin's arms. The cameras, the cameras can go to blazes for all I care. Take a look, you lying, spying wretches. Here's what I think. The man made an extremely rude hand gesture at the black-eyed Susan vines covering one wall. Matt had copied that gesture once and been yelled at by Celia. Please, if you won't think of yourself, think of us. Celia had gone on her knees by the bodyguard's bench. She clasped her hands the way she did in, in, in prayer. Tam Lin shook himself like a dog. Ah! It's the drink talking. He grabbed the remaining champagne bottle and hurled it against the wall. Matt heard the fragments shower over the black-eyed Susans. I'll tell you this much, lad. He hauled Matt up by the front of his shirt. Celia watched with a pale, frightened face. You were grown in that poor cow for nine months. And then you were cut out of her. You were harvested. He had a cesarean. She was sacrificed. That's the term they use when they kill a poor um, lab animal. Your stepmother was turned into ruddy T-bone steaks. He dropped Matt. Matt backed away out of reach. It's all right, Tamlin, Celia said gently. She eased onto the seat b beside him. It's not all right, the man buried his head and his arms on the table. We're bloody lab animals to this lot. We're only well treated until we outlive our, our usefulness. They won't get their way forever, Celia whispered, putting her arms around him. Tamlin twist, twisted his head until he could peer out from the shelter of his arms. I know what you've got in mind, and, and it's dangerous, he said. Celia leaned against him and rubbed his back with her large, gentle hands. This farm has been here for a hundred years. How many Egypts do you think are buried under the poppies? Thousands. Hundreds of thousands, Tamlin's voice was almost a groan. Do you think that's enough? Celia smiled at Matt as she rubbed the bodyguard's back. It was a real smile this time, and it made her beautiful in the shadow garden, in the shadowy gar garden light. Go to bed, mi vida, she said. I'll look in on you later. Matt was annoyed that the two seemed to be, have forgotten it was his party, his coming-of-age party. He sulked in his bedroom. He, he twanged at the guitar, hoping the noise would disturb the pair huddled in the garden. But after a while, his anger f faded away. It was replaced by a feeling that he had overlooked something important. Hence that um, had a thick fireflies in the courtyard garden. They brightened with promise. They... they, they stayed almost long enough to show Matt where they were, but then, like the fireflies, they vanished. Tam Lynn and Cecilia were far too careful. It had been like that for years. Matt knew there was a vital information he was missing. It had to do with the clones. He wasn't supposed to know how they were made. He wasn't supposed to know all of them, except for him, were brain dead. Now, for the hundredth time, Matt thought about why anyone would create a monster. It couldn't be to replace a beloved child. Children were loved and clones were hated. It couldn't be to have a pet. No pet resembled the horrible, terrified thing Matt had seen in the hospital. Matt remembered Mr. McGregor and El Patron sitting in the adjoining wheelchairs after their operations. Got me a new liver, McGregor had said patting his stomach, and went in for a set of kidneys while I was at it. He looked at Matt with those bright blue eyes that were so much like Tom's, and Matt had been revolted. No, it couldn't be. Matt remembered the birthday party where El Patron had so suddenly recovered his mental abilities, fetal brain implants. I must try that sometimes, 
McGregor had said. It's done wonders for you. Don't put it off too long, El Patron had replied. You have to give the doctors at least five months lead time. Eight is better. It couldn't be. Matt pressed his hands against his temples to keep the idea inside. If he didn't, if he didn't think it, it wouldn't be real. But it slipped through his fingers anyway. McGregor had created a clone so he could have transplants when he needed them. The thing in the hospital had every reason to howl. And what was the source of El Patron's fetal implants? Or the piggybacked heart that kept his old, a leaky one going? The evidence was there. Only Matt's blindness had kept him from seeing the truth. And his unwill unwillingness, unwillingness to think about it. He wasn't stupid. The clues had been there all along. The truth had, had been too overwhelming to bear. El Patron had created clones to provide himself with transplants. He was exactly the same as McGregor. No, not the same. Because I'm different. Matt thought desperately, staring up at the ceiling of his bedroom. Celia had uh, pasted um, glow-in-the-dark stars all over the surface. From the time Matt had moved into her apartment, he'd gone to sleep under a faintly shining canopy of stars. The presence soothed and comforted him now. I'm different. I wasn't created to provide spare parts. El Patron had refused to let the doctors destroy Matt's hump brain. He protected him and gave and given him Celia and Tamlin for company. He'd hired Mr. Ortega to teach Matt music. The old man took great pride in the boy's accomplishment. That was not the behavior of someone who planned, to, who planned to murder you later. Matt consciously slowed his breathing. He had been um, painting, panting like a bird uh, trapped inside a room. Matt had seen birds die of panic when they couldn't beat their way through a closed window. He had to think the situation through, reason, reason it out. It was clear, whatever had happened to the other poor clones, that Matt wasn't meant to be that to be one of them. El Patron was moved by a motive very different from McGregor's. It was, the boy realized, simply vanity. When the old man looked at Matt, he saw himself, young, strong, sound of, of mind. It was like looking in a mirror. The effect wouldn't be the same. If Matt were drooling, blubbering thing on a hospital bed, Matt clutched the pillow the way he'd hugged stuffed animals before he was too old for such things. He felt like he'd been yanked back from a high cliff. There was still the terrible fate of the other clones to consider. My brothers, thought Matt. He trembled as he tried to recall the, his devotion to the man who had created him. El Patron loved him, but he was evil. A more evil, vicious, and self-serving man could hardly be imagined. Esperanza had written her book on the land of opium. Matt had hurled the book away violently when he read that, but Matt had been a boy then. He was a man now, or something like it. Men, Tamlin often told him, had the courage to look things in the eye. You have a fever, cried Celia. When she and Tamlin came to say goodnight, she hurried off to make herbal tea. Tamlin stood and watched from the doorway. The silhouette of the bodyguard looked menacing, and Matt remembered he'd killed 20 children with a bomb intended for the English Prime Minister. The man seemed to soak up the faint starlight from the ceiling. When Silly returned with the tea, Tamlin shrugged and said, I, In answer to your question, lad, you're 14 years old. Then he went off to his room in El Patron's heavily guarded wing of the house. Hey guys, if you've enjoyed this uh, video, please watch my next one. Chapter 20.